Okay. Lag Boimer, Rabbi Say. Heilige, Heilige Lag Boimer. Azad Day. So I want to spend a few minutes discussing the Inyanim of Lag Boimer and uh, obviously the connection to the Heilige of Shimon, of course. We did a bit this morning, but we'll continue with a little bit of a different, a bit of a different derech. So we all know, we're all familiar with the famous story the Gemara tells us very clearly that Rabbi Kiva, the Heilige Rabbi Kiva, was 40 years old when he decided the time has come to sit and learn Torah. Time has come to sit and learn. And um, until that stage, he was a very, you know, simple person. And he would basically take care of a lot of his physical needs, uh, not his spiritual needs. And uh, like many of our Avois and Moshe Rabbeinu himself, he was a shepherd. Heideke Rabbi Kiva was a shepherd. And um, it's interesting because how does it work that a 40-year-old man all of a sudden decides to learn Torah? A 40-year-old man decides to return to Yiddishkeit, sit and learn, and became who he became, of which we know was an incredible, incredible thing. And we all know the story, and we're familiar with the story, but for the sake of what I want to mention, I think it's important to go over the story, which again is a Mufurashah Chazal, that was walking one day in the field, and he saw a tremendous, tremendous miracle. Um, he saw an incredible miracle which... Unlike Moshe Rabbeinu, who saw something completely supernatural, Rabbi Kiva saw something which was almost natural, and almost something which didn't, you know, strike him as anything incredible. But he came across a rock, and he looked at this rock, and he saw there was a little cavity, there was a little hole that was sort of in this, the bottom of the rock, and he was, you know, looking at it and pondering exactly how that happened. And he saw how it happened, because he saw a drop of water every so often that sort of dripped on exactly the same spot, again and again and again, drip, drip, drip. And he saw that the koyach of a little bit of water, you know, water is not something powerful, water is not something heavy, it's not something that can generally form anything in even a piece of plastic. But he saw that after the many years of it dropping down, it managed to bear a hole in the rock, which was something incredible, and he noticed that. And he understood something very, very incredible. He understood that if a little bit of water can penetrate through a rock, then basically Torah, which is also an incredible tough as steel, can penetrate his mind. And that's the, what he made up at that moment. That's the, his decision that Rabbi Kiva made at that time. Now, what was the lesson of the rock? What was really the lesson that Rabbi Kiva was learning himself? So Rabbi Kiva was basically... He could have learned a few things. He could have learned that Torah is learned drop by drop. In other words, Torah is learned little by little, which you add up and accumulate more and more, which is definitely true. And it definitely bears truth to a lot of things. But something more than that, and something more appropriate was when he witnessed this uh, water crushing a rock, then it shows that even a rock which is very, very, very big, and almost impossible to, to change a rock. You know, if you want to go and chisel out a rock, you have to take equipment and tools in order to chisel it out and drills and all sorts of things. You can't just take a, you know, you can't take your fingers and start pushing it down. It doesn't work that way, right? So he understood that his brain, that up until that stage, had never been intellectually challenged, had never been really gone into the depths of what Yiddishkeit is and how the world was created and the Rabbi Nishlam and everything else, so then he will be able to penetrate his mind. And that was one of the lessons that it is, and that was the breakthrough that Rabbi Kiva had at that time. He went, as we know, to, to learn Torah at that time, and not only did he learn Torah, he went along to teach Torah, and he became one of the most popular Rebbeim ever to exist, over 20,000 Talmidim, and where did it all come from? One small drop of water. Okay, now, I want to move on. What is the reason for the celebration of Lag Boimeh? Why do we have Lag Boimeh, right? It's a, it's a very interesting thing, and, and maybe perhaps we'll discuss this maybe in the mornings a little bit. You know, we have Sfira Sa'ima from Pesach until Shavuos, and the Minig is to observe various types of Avelis of mourning for at least 33 days, first half, second half, whatever it is. It's very interesting. Lag Boimeh is a Semcha. Why? Because they stop dying. That's a reason to celebrate. Ah, I understand. It's a wonderful thing. They stop dying. It's beautiful. But to make a Zayyontu because they stopped dying? What, what, what is the reason? We, we never have such a thing. Such a Yontu because they stopped dying. So there are many famous reasons for Lag Boimer, of which we'll probably go through in the morning. What I want to do now is I want to actually discuss one of the less known reasons of the celebration of Lag Boimer. And I think it's important. 
It's important because, again, I've said this, I said it already this morning, this, that when we do something, it's kedai to know why we do it. Many times we do things in life and we have no idea what we're doing. You know, well, even, even, even to the simple things, right? Even to the, this week, Parshas Emma, all the Yom Yom Tovim. How many of us really know the depths of every Yom Tov? But we do it anyway. How many of us know the depths of Shabbos Kodesh, of Tefillin, of Tzitzis, of Negevasa? But we do it anyway. Now that's okay. Sometimes you have to do it anyway up, up until you learn the lesson. But the idea should be that eventually you understand why you're doing it. And it's very, very important. It adds a lot of meaning to the mitzvah. The Chinuch, as we know, writes, Tamei HaMitzvah is the taste of mitzvahs. It's very, it's very schmack to get a taste of a mitzvah. The taste of the mitzvah isn't the mitzvah. When you taste the food, it's not the food. You're tasting the taste of the food. The food itself is something you digest, it's something that goes in. But the taste is geschmack. It's, it's nice for something to have a nice taste. It doesn't need to have a nice taste, but it's geschmack. So therefore, it's a good eye for us to know at least one of the reasons why Lag Boim is what it is. You're going to go to Meiron, you're going to see people dancing, people happy, people besamcha, and, and it's taka beautiful. And it really is. And you get nimshach achra, right? Bayachai nimshach ta'ashrecha, we get... That's how it is. But why? So I want to go through one of the unknown. It's not unknown, but one of the less known reasons that, again, it's a Gemara, it's Chazal, tell us very, very clearly what happened. Okay? Now, the Gemara tells us that one of the closest relationships that exist, one of, is a Talmud and a Rebbe. A Talmud and a Rebbe have a tremendously close relationship. Why? It's due to many things, but one of them is also because the Talmud understands that his Rebbe is giving him Olam Abba, his Rebbe is giving him a Halacha Chaim, is teaching him how to live, is teaching him how to live in a successful, in a happy and very productive way, and therefore it gives him purpose for life, which is a very important thing. That's why he has a very, very close relationship with his Rebbe. Can you imagine, when you had Rebbe Akiva, Rebbe Akiva had 24,000 Talmudim, right? Now, he had a connection, I'm sure, to all of them. And between Pesach and Shavuos, which is a very short amount of time, it's not a long time, over 24,000 Talmudim died. Uh, could you understand what that is? I just said this morning, I think, to Nosh Meir, I said, you know, how hard it is for me, on a personal level, every year, where boys leave the yeshiva. And it happens, and it's fine, and it's good, and it's meant to be that way. Baruch Hashem, boys move on, boys go back, whatever it is that they go, they go to the place that they're going to go to. I find it very, very hard. What can I tell you? I walk in the dorms in the summer and it's like empty and like, where, where is everyone? Right? So even on a Bainas Manim. But it's, it's, when, when guys leave, it's, what can I tell you? It's very, very hard. It's what it is, right? Baruch Hashem, we have, a great, we have a great relationship. We're very close and it's very hard when guys leave. Can you imagine Rabbi Kiva? These Talmidim died. 24,000 Talmidim in the time between Pesach and Shavuos? Can you imagine what Rabbi Kiva felt in that time? Can you imagine? Uh, what a tremendous tragedy, right? 33 days, unbelievable. Now, these Talmidim who died were not just as Talmidim, but these were Talmidim that he had given smicha to. Now, what is smicha? Let me explain what smicha is. The Nitziv, the Parshas Pinchos, the Hemikadova, tells us smicha is not just you tested the guy and he knows your idea. He knows that a Pasch and Hilcha Shabbos. But you're actually continuing the chain of Klal Yisrael. Because the Mishnah tells us the beginning of Pirkei Yavis, Moshe Kibbal Torah Misinai. So Moshe gave it over to Aaron, and Aaron to the Zakanim, and then it went from generation to generation, from, from Rebbe to Talmud, from Rebbe to Talmud. In every generation, Rebbein gave over Torah to their Talmudim. So smicha wasn't just, you have smicha and you have a certificate, now your father-in-law will be happy, you put it on the wall, and Gavaldi, now you can pass in all the shailas. doesn't work that way. Smicha then, a little bit different to what it is now, but smicha then was continuing the chain of Klal Yisrael. So many of the 24,000 Talmidim that died between Pesach and Shavuos actually had smicha, which was a tremendous loss for Klal Yisrael, not only for Rabbi Kiva, because it meant that the future of Klal Yisrael was at stake over here. Who knew, who knew what would happen? Who was going to teach Klal Yisrael? Who was going to be the Rabbonim? Who will be the Ranhigim, the Tzadikim? Who would ruin, run the generation? What would happen? Who, where, what's going to be with Klal Yisrael? That's what happens over here. Now, all these Talmud Rabbi Kiva, when Smicha died, Rabbi Kiva said, we have a big problem. We have a major problem. <laughs> I, I'm not going to live forever. All my Talmud that I trained for Smicha, which again, wasn't just a piece of paper, but was a Mahalach HaChaim, which was to get the next generation involved, had died. Now I'm stuck. What do I do at this stage? So he looked at his remaining Talmud and he decided there was only one of all his Talmud that were left, that could be Roy fitting for smicha. And that was Rabbi Huda ben Bava. Rabbi Huda ben Bava, so he, Rabbi Kiva sat and he trained him 
and he gave him smicha on Lag Boime. By the way, there's a minute brought down that some people receive the smicha on Lag Boime because of this. So Bikiva sat with his Talmud, his one and only Talmud that he felt was Roy, Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba, and he gave him smicha on that day. One of the reasons, by the way, for celebrating on Lag Boim is he received smicha, which was incredible. Let's continue the story. On that day, Rabbi Kiva decided that there must be more. It cannot be we can have one Talmud with smicha. There's got to be more. Who's going to run the next generation? So he went with five of his Talmudim to the south of Eretz Yisrael. And these Talmudim, listen carefully, were as follows. Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Yaisi, and Rabbi Nechemia. These were the five Talmudim Rabbi Kiva took in order to go and train them in smicha also. However, there was a problem. And the problem was, before Rabbi Kiva was able to give them smicha, he was captured by the Romans, and he was one of the Asari Ruge Malchus, and he was killed in a very, very horrific fashion, and he died. Which means, he died without having to give them smicha. Now, you have to understand as well, the Romans at that time understood that smicha was very important. They had banned smicha. They had said anyone that gets smicha, number one, gets put to death, and number two, the town that they are in will be totally destroyed. Why? Because they again understood smicha was the continuation of Kalal Yisrael. We need to wipe out Kalal Yisrael. So if we wipe out smicha, there'll be no continuation of Kalal Yisrael. So they understood what it means. So they killed them at the right time in their eyes because this way nobody will get smicha. Now, what happened next? So the Gemara tells us that Rabbi Huda ben Bava went with these five Talmidim, right? That Rabbi Kiva originally wanted to give smicha to, and he went to a valley. Right, a valley, right, a low place between two mountains, far away from anywhere, to not, not to get caught. And he sat with them, Yom and Valoyla, teaching them smicha, teaching them the Mahalach, in order to eventually give them smicha. The Romans at the time discovered what was happening. The troops, the army, came into the valley. And Rabbi Yehuda started hearing the troops coming. He realizes what's going on. He's been caught. He's stuck. What does he do now? So he basically quickly gave them smicha. They were right at that time. He quickly ordained them all. They all got smicha. And he told them all, get out of here. Run. I'm, I'm going to stay here. I'll attract the, the army will come to me. You get out of here. This way you'll be able to escape. Because by the time they capture me and they find you, it's not going to be in a game. They said, Rebbe, what's going to be with you? And he said, don't worry about it. I'm a stone that cannot be overturned. And uh, he gave that the chance to escape. And the Gemara tells us, in the Sanhedrin Yudalad, that the Romans threw so many spears into Rabbi Huda ben Bova, that his body basically looked like a sieve with so many holes from the spears that he had. Okay, so they killed him in a terrible, terrible way. Now, by said Rabbi Kiva, at the time of this story, the Seyed Adoris tells us, was 92 years old, right? It, it, unbelievable. If Rabbi Kiva could have turned around and said, you know, he lost all these Talmidim, I'm going back a little bit, could have turned around and said, I give up, I, I can't do this anymore. But Rabbi Kiva said, no, I'm not taking a day off, I'm continuing. I'm going to continue, even though I lost all my Talmidim, there's a couple left, there's a few left, I'm going to com continue going. Why? Because he learned from the drop of water. He learned from that little drop of water that he learned every drop can eventually penetrate. And he said, even one drop can do something. And if I've got one Talmud left, I'm going to go with that Talmud. And that's an incredible thing. You know why? Because today, Ata Yemezeh, right? Tovshin Pe'alaf, 2021. We learn from these Talmidim. How do we know that? Because what do we learn from? Mishnah, Sifra, Sifri, Tosefta, and Seda Olam. The Gemara in Sanhedrin tells us that any Stam Mishnah is who? Remeya. Any Sifra is Rabbi Huda. Every Sifri is Rabbi Shimon. Every Tosefta is Rabbi Nechemia, and Seda Olam is Rabbi Reisi. So on Lag Ba'oyme, what happened at that time was the future of all Klal Yisrael. The Torah that we learn today was because of what happened over there. It's because Rabbi Kiva continues, because Rabbi Kiva persevered. And where did that start? with the one drop of water. Rabbi said the message that we should penetrate within us on Lag Ba'ime is one drop of water caused all of that story to happen, caused our Torah that we learn today to be the Torah of Rabbi Kiva that continued and persevered when he was so bad, when anything could have happened, he could have been depressed and everyone would have said, it's fine, we understand why you're depressed, you just lost your Talmidim, Shem Yerachim, 24,000 of them in the space of a few weeks. But no, he continued and he kept on going. The message of Lag Ba'ime, right? It could be hard. Life has its challenges. Life is difficult sometimes. As the Messiah Shushram says, Kol in Yonei Oilam Everything's an Esoyin. Our whole life sometimes could be an Esoyin. It's difficult, it's hard. Keep on going. Keep on going. Drop after drop. 
day after day. If yesterday was a bad day, today would be a good day. If last hour was a bad hour, this hour would be a good hour. That's the message of Lag Boimeh. Take that message, live that message, and the Ezra Hashem, the Rabbanish will give us all the Valdegas, the Atadish Maya.